we are going to look at the Food Vision Dairy and the Beef, sheep meat, beef she and Sheep Meat Groups. So uh, Jerry Boyle and Thea Hennessy are going to join us at the stage now. Right. Um, so I'll come to you uh, first, Jerry. You've been chairing the Food Vision Dairy Group, and uh, you've been chairing it since January. So can you give us an idea, some kind of an update on what you have done in the last few months, please? Thanks, Helen. I thought uh, being director of Chagas was a challenge. But, uh, <laughs> um, the dairy group has been challenging for the simple reason that uh, livelihoods are at stake and uh, farmers are, of course, are very passionate about their livelihoods and uh, the future of agriculture in terms of the next generation that will be expected to take over farm businesses. So from the outset, our approach was, uh, as was clear from the Food Vision report, uh, we wanted to focus on suite of measures that would actually deliver on the very demanding targets. Uh, they've crystallized now in the 5.75 million tonnes reduction that would be required by 2030 from the July decision of government. And from the very outset, we were very fortunate to have all of the farm organizations, of course, but also all the state agencies involved. And we wanted to make it crystal clear that changes that we would be recommending for government to adopt and for farmers to implement would actually be reflected in the so-called national inventory of greenhouse gases, uh, which um, the uh, EPA compiled. And that was very important because we figured from the beginning there was huge confusion out there as to measures that farmers were taking um, and very actively embracing less, for example, the use of additional lime, which you know, has really grown dramatically in the last two years. Now, what this year's figure is, what last year's figure was a growth of 50%. Farmers are using more or less, for example, that's the, the low emission uh, slurry spreading and so on. But of course, what we wanted to point out that these enable farmers to achieve a reduction in inventory. They don't directly impact on the inventory. So thanks, I would say, particularly to the advice from EPA, we focused in on those measures that would, where action was taken, would directly reduce the inventory, and thereby we would see it in the statistics. Because for too long, I think, for several years, we've had this narrative that rightly, farmers were engaging very much in the environmental challenge but that engagement wasn't being reflected in the statistics. So that was one of our primary focus. And um, I hope our report uh, will be finalized very soon. It's virtually ready to go. A huge amount of work was put in. Um, I would say there has been very positive engagement by all parties. Uh, but I would accept this is an exceptionally difficult challenge. So we have crystallized down our recommendations into probably the most challenging one has been to tackle the nitrogen issue, the chemical nitrogen issue head on. Um, and I think Tim Cullinan said earlier, this year because of prices, we're probably back by about 20%. Now it varies across the sectors. I think that's a fantastic opportunity to build on. We need to go more than that. But if we could consolidate what we've achieved this year and then build on that to 2030, that would be a magnificent achievement. We've secondly taken the, one of the outstanding pieces of research information that's been produced in recent years by my former colleagues in Chagas has been the recognition that the use of a product called protected urea uh, instead of the traditional calcium ammonium nitrates can reduce uh, greenhouse gases without affecting productivity. And we're hoping that in the next couple of years, with the support of all of the industry, the department, farmers themselves, and of course agribusiness, we can encourage 100% adoption of protected urea on farms. The third element, which is really important, and someone, I think it was, the minister might have mentioned, but so that others, research is telling us that feed additives, certainly by the end of the decade, um, will be enabled 
to be used on grasslands, and that will significantly reduce emissions. There's also potential through ICBF and Chagas efforts to improve the, um, the methane component of the EBI and the Eurostar indices, and that will also reduce emissions. Um, and we have proposed also, in addition to that, a, a voluntary reduction stroke exit program. But even if you only take the first four measures, and I would think what is really positive, dairy we estimate from the Chagas National Farm Survey accounts for about 40% of emissions. So if we take the fine, fine 75, that target is to reduce emissions from dairy by about 2.3 megatons. The measures that we are working on collectively, farmers, agribusiness, state agencies, the department, have, and I'm really pleased about this, we've come very close to achieving the proportional reduction that will be required. Okay. Now, I'm not saying, of course, that's going to be easy. By, by no manner of means. And that came through discussion after discussion. Because one of the key enablers will require substantial investment by the state. That is, as Frank Amara said, investment in research, and particularly, I would underline, investment in knowledge transfer. Because what we want to do, Helen, is transform the agriculture that we've become accustomed to, which is a grass-based system, hugely based on the use of chemical nitrogen. We want to transform that to a system now which will continue to use chemical nitrogen, of course, but will be massively supplemented with the use of clover and, and other uh, and so-called multi-species wards. And that will require significant support from every advisor, public and private, in the country to make, help farmers make that transition. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Thea, you've been sharing the beef and sheep group since June, I think. Yep. So, um, has it been as, as all encompassing a task as Jerry's? Can you give us an update on how you've been getting on, please? It has, it has. We started a little bit later, so we're not quite at the final report stage yet, but a very similar approach, very consultative approach. I'm glad that 88% of people think we need all stakeholders to get behind this because. That's the approach we've taken. And while we've come to the process with very different perspectives, it's great to see that everybody's really committed to reaching those targets in the best way possible. I mean, there's more than 80 or 90,000 farm families involved in beef and sheep production, so the decisions we make will be really important. So we've set about a very similar process, really, to what Jerry has described there for dairy. I suppose what I would say is that the background is very different, and maybe that's why we have two very different groups, the economic landscape, the trends in terms of emissions, the demographic landscape even of beef and sheep is very different to the dairy sector. Um, when we look at the emissions over the last number of years, the number of suckler cows has been declining since 2015, down nearly 20% emissions from the suckler cow herd because the progeny is declining as well, then is reducing. And I suppose one of the key issues we're grappling with as well in our group is the integration of the dairy beef coming from the dairy herd into the beef sector and how that contributes to the overall emissions profile and some of the challenges that that presents for, for beef producers as well. I think because we've had so much emphasis on economic sustainability today, we'd have to say a little bit about the difference in the economic landscape of the, of the two sectors we're talking about. We've seen huge divergence over the years in terms of the levels of income in dairy and beef and that's been, I suppose, um, exacerbated further in the last 12 months where we see dairy prices staying ahead of input cost uh, inflation but not so in the beef sector and I suppose what we're looking at then in the beef sector is um, farms of a much smaller scale a lower level of profitability and we must factor all that into the capacity then of farmers to invest in new technology and to adapt and to change so I suppose that's that's the point we're starting from and then we were lucky I suppose that Jerry's group had started already because we we looked at those measures first, but equally we think there are additional measures that can deliver for the beef sector. So we have looked at the early age of slaughter, um, which was mentioned earlier um, by Philip on one of the earlier panels. The research from Chagas has shown that in the right conditions and with the right management and breed of animal, that animals can be finished earlier and um, uh, at an improved profitability. But importantly then that's fewer, fewer animals 
in the country emitting greenhouse gas emissions, so that makes a contribution to abating um, our greenhouse gas emissions as well. So that potentially could be one of these win-win strategies, but again, it needs the support of Chagask and the advisory service to roll that knowledge out and have it adopted at the farm level. So that's maybe one of the different measures that we're looking at on the beef side. And while the concerns of both uh, dairy and beef and sheep are, are, are different, we've spoken a lot today about the importance of, of building bridges between uh, different groups and working together. So while the concerns are different, I suppose the main aim is the same really for both groups, isn't it, Jerry? It is, and, but uh, there was some criticism uh, that we had two separate groups and uh, clearly at some point they will have to come together and I think that is the plan. Um, one issue that in recent times we focus on is exactly what Thea says, is the, the importance, and I think Philip said it as well, and I would agree 100%, Philip Carls uh, commented on the need to integrate dairy and beef. Um, and I think that's going to happen anyway. Market forces usually are the, the main drivers of these kind of developments. Um, that will also achieve a number of objectives in respect, for example, of alternative enterprises. One of the big challenges for farmers is facing into this transition, this massive transition that is required. Uh, a legitimate question is what are alternatives? I think by integrating in dairy and beef, we have one of the very obvious alternatives um, that uh, should be exploited. And in fact, I would see it as part of the uh, uh, as part of the circular economy indeed. You know, we talk a lot about that and uh, it's a very good practical um, example of circularity at work. So, look, at some point, um, the outcomes of our two reports will have to be uh, discussed and will be discussed and considered by um, all groups. But I think at this stage, for clarity, there are different issues, there's a different context. I think it was useful to have two individual reports all driving in the same direction. Because the big, the big challenge for agriculture is, is this, its decarbonisation challenge is common to all sectors. And that is uh, to reduce the usage of chemical nitrogen. That's the agricultural decarbonisation challenge. And thankfully, for all ruminant sectors, research has demonstrated the alternatives for many, many years. Um, in Chagask and in other places, uh, we've demonstrated, or it has been, de I should keep saying we, apologies, Frank, it has been demonstrated that, um, you know, clover can substantially replace chemical nitrogen, and newer research on multi-species swords also uh, has demonstrated that there are alternatives out there. And the challenge is always going to be to persuade farmers that there is a different way of doing things, a more challenging way, perhaps, compared to what people have been used to. Um, but, and it will take time. It's not going to happen overnight. You're talking about, I don't use that word transformation lightly. Um, it's a, total new, a totally different and newer way of doing business on all our ruminant farms. Um, Thea, if we talk about the particular challenges, back again to the, the beef and sheep group, um, I suppose, that, I presume there's an appetite there then to see a market return if we achieve these um, reduction targets. And I know with Board Bia we heard earlier that the markets are looking for uh, concrete evidence um, that, that um, emissions are coming down and that the carbon footprint of, of it is coming down. So how vital is it that there is a, um, that the market returns, that there is a, a, a financial incentive from the market to achieve these targets? Absolutely, and I mean, I think that's a core part, obviously, of, of the food vision is to protect the viability of the sector as well. We're very much focused at the moment on the emissions reduction part of food vision, but we will move on to the implementation of some of the other elements as well around getting a premium price for grass-based products, uh, support for producer groups and other economic initiatives that can, that can return that. I suppose the approach we're taking is we're looking at direct measures, measures that can lead to a, a, a direct reduction in greenhouse gas emissions but then focusing as well on the enabling actions that will be required to make them happen, and that may be investment at the primary producer level, at the industry level, uh, at the government level, um, but clearly some of the measures we're looking at will have a cost. Uh, we need to see where that will be born, and we need to understand if industry can deliver that through higher prices. Maybe that's not the case. It's not a very good time at the moment with food price inflation to be expecting consumers to pay more, so I think that's an important part of the, the process to come, that once we've identified the measures and we've assessed the costs as 
how those costs can be funded. Uh, speaking of, I suppose, that the industry, um, dairy processing in particular, uh, Jerry, is very profitable. So what would you like to see, or what are you hearing that uh, companies should be doing to support their farmer suppliers? Well, uh, it's no secret that one of the measures we've advocated is that all of the Irish co-op sector, dairy processing sector, should um, should have uh, sustainability programs of their own. And there are a number that have uh, been leading the pack, so to speak, that are very positive in that direction. We would recommend that all of them uh, adopt such measures. And the only tweak I, I think that is important, and I know it's a technical point, but it's a very important one, is that additional incentives be given for measures that directly reduce the inventory, right? Because that is what's going to be measured at the end of the day. Um, and while the enabling factors are important, um, if they don't, they don't directly impact on the inventory. It's like I was just thinking of an analogy there. It's like going on a diet and you decide that because you're going on a diet, you can eat much more sausages for breakfast, you know. That's been the difficulty we have had. We've got to use the enabling measures to allow for a reduction in the intensity of, of chemical nitrogen use. The other thing that we have discussed, and I think there's been, uh, within the Dairy uh, Food Vision Group, and I think there's been a fair amount of consensus for it, I'm happy to say, is that the co-op themselves, all the co-ops, develop a common charter in relation to how they uh, allow uh, new entrants into the business. And uh, the group felt it was really important that in assessing new applications for completely new supply, um, that the importance of the family farm and the need to ensure generation renewal were key, if you like, um, priorities in that assessment. So I certainly think that that charter uh, will have an impact. It will take a number of time again, uh, some time for that to be realised. But I think we'll also encourage debate within the co-ops as to the sustainability challenge and what they can practically, practically do to support their suppliers. So finally, a question for both of you. Both of you have uh, started your work chairing your respective groups since January and since June. And um, a lot has changed since um, the, the, the main work of Food Vision 2030 was done, and particularly with relation to the war in Ukraine. So how much has that had an impact on the, um, the work of the group and the priorities of the group? I might come to you first on that, Thea. I think it's had an impact in a couple of ways. I mean, it's obviously impacted on the costs of production, and that has both negative and, out and positive outcomes. We see uh, less use of fertilizers this year, which will be positive from an inventory perspective. But equally, if that's damaging from an economic perspective, that's less profit and ability of farmers to reinvest in their business and adopt new technologies and all of that. Um, so that's on the input price side. I think the food security issue has very much come to the fore again. We see is it a tripling of the number of people at risk of famine. Um, related to the war in the Ukraine, but we must remember also related to climate change. So it's very easy for us to focus on food security and talk about producing more food, but we also still have to meet our climate change commitments because that is a really big contributor to the food and security issues we have at the moment. So I think they're probably the main um, changes that we've seen, but it certainly bring, brought food to the fore, I think, just beyond the stakeholders in this room who think about it every day, but more commonly, and I think that's, that's a really good thing as well, that, that people are aware of the issues we're facing. Thank Would you have a similar enough experience, Charles? Very much so. I can recall vividly, I, it was shortly after the, the invasion, the illegal invasion of Ukraine, um, this issue was raised at the very beginning of the meeting, uh, the potential trade-off between food security on the one hand and sustainability on the other hand. And as we worked through it, I'd like to think that uh, we broadened our understanding of the food security challenge because sustainability is at the heart of global food security challenge in the longer term. Um, while we can recognize clearly there is an issue in the short term created by the, by the war and particularly by the higher energy escalation energy prices, um, the bigger picture is that global food security and nutritional security 
is threatened by climate change and by other um, environmental challenges. So uh, uh, that was one aspect. The other issue, of course, uh, and I would absolutely agree with Thea, um, the, the response by farmers to the relative increase in the price of uh, nitrogen fertilizer in particular has been exactly what economists would predict. Uh, there has been a substantial decline. And as I said earlier, I think in the context of the challenge we have for 2030, I think we should see that as a positive and say, how can we build on that now? How can we put in place the measures that farmers can use in terms of uh, additional clover, multi-species swords to compensate for the reduction in fertilizer and continue from that base? So I think next year, I think someone said it earlier, agriculture is going to look very well in terms of the inventory, largely because of the reduction in fertilizer, fertilizer use, nitrogen in particular. Let's build on that and move on. Uh, but to do that, we need to put in place the, the compensatory technologies that farmers can adopt. Okay. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank uh, both of our speakers, Jerry Boyle and Thea Hennessy. Thank you very much thank for you. joining us.